Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Frank Luntz, pollster and political consultant. Frank, thanks so much for joining me again. Both presumptive nominees made headlines over major issues impacting the election, so we're going to talk about both of them. First, let's talk about Donald Trump and his comments surrounding abortion. He said Wednesday he would not sign a nationwide ban on abortion if he wins in November, and this comes just a few days after he said abortion is a state's issue, not a federal one. What do you think this does for his cause? It was the perfectly quaffed answer. And I was actually very impressed about the language that he used behind it. Of course, Arizona goes and does what it does the day after and destroys Trump's efforts. Uh, it's just confirmation that every day of this campaign is going to be another turn, another action that we don't expect. Trump basically has taken the position that America has taken which is that state should make the decision, abortion should be safe, legal, but under some constraints, under some limitations. And he had articulated it incredibly well at the beginning of this week. Then Arizona goes and bans abortion in all cases, except for a life of the mother in legislation, in law that the governor herself acknowledged was written before women could even vote. And that just set this whole country afire. In the end, abortion is going to help Democrats. It's going to make it more difficult for Trump to get the votes that he needs. And it's a motivating factor, particularly for younger women under age 30, who are not particularly happy with either candidate. I think it's a net gain for the Democrats and Trump, even though he handled it well, it's uh, he's going to have problems with this going forward. As you know, Donald Trump has flirted with the idea of a 15 week federal abortion ban. Since then, he's made clear that he thinks it is a state's issue, but he has taken credit for the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So will this alienate the more conservative, the more pro-life faction of the, his party? It could, but there's no way they're going to vote for Joe Biden. They will be upset with Donald Trump for weeks, maybe even months, but they're certainly not going to vote for the for the incumbent that they feel that this is something that I really want to emphasize. I'm so often asked, why does the evangelical community back Donald Trump, even though he seems to do things that are so hostile to their values and the way they live? And my answer is quite clear to them. Trump, it's not what Trump does. It's not even what he says. It's his commitment to voters of faith to protect them against the government that is seen to be hostile to their beliefs, to their practices, and only Trump does this. So even though they will be upset with his centrist position on abortion, it's much more supportive of where they stand than the uh, Democratic nominee. Abortion, as we said, is a losing issue for Republicans. So is this position that Trump has- but Let me jump in. And this is what every reporter has said. And I've been talking about this now for the last 24 hours. I do have to say this, and I should have said this in my answer to the very first question. On some things, it's not whether it's a voting issue. On some things, it doesn't matter where the public stands. I'm a believer in education. I believe that we have to invest more, we have to do better, and I don't care whether voters agree or disagree. My commitment is to my students, my commitment is to the future, and it doesn't matter who's articulating it. I will support those who support my students. I will oppose those who make their lives more difficult. It's the same thing on abortion. It actually doesn't really matter. And I think that we, that we sell the American public short by making everything a political battle, by making everything, what is, how does it impact in November? In fact, I think there's some things more important than a simple election. And that is what's about to happen in this November. I don't consider the outcome to be about the next four years. I consider the outcome to be about the next four decades, not what happens in the next election. It's what we do to the next generation that matters most. And it matters so much to me that I apologize for interrupting you, 
but we have to start looking at our country, not just on election day, but where we're going in the months and years ahead of that. And everything cannot be a political issue that we seek to get advantage over. That's a really interesting point. And talk about that a little more. You don't think that this just is impacting us the next four years. It's going to be the next 40. How so? And lay out those hypothetical 40 years. Let's say Joe Biden wins. Let's say Donald Trump wins. Well, we got a challenge right now in terms of trust. It's the number one value that Americans are desperate for in this country to save our democracy. Trust. Am I getting the truth from the media? Am I getting the truth from the candidates? Or is the business community telling me the truth or are they lying to me? Trust and the truth are essential. And if we undermine that between now and election day, I don't know how we'll get it back. It's one reason why I think it's so important that the networks and the media do get the chance to host three presidential debates. I believe the public has the right to the truth and we have the responsibility to give them that truth. That's number one. Number two is results. Will we ever trust Washington or government in any level to say what they mean, mean what they say, and actually do what they say? Right now, there are so many issues that are contentious, from inflation to immigration, from housing to healthcare, and we don't see any action in any of them. Can we get back the belief that government can be the connector or at least be the instigator of those things that we regard as essential for every American. And then third is accountability. Accountability, personal responsibility, integrity. Uh, The idea that the people that we are elected, we should have faith and trust in them to abide by our will, to seek to represent us efficiently and effectively. And these three elements, no, they're not about specific issues, but these three elements are in play right now. And of all the things that have me nervous, these are the three that matter most. If we fail between now and November, then I think the coming year is gonna be pretty sad for this country. If we succeed, if we succeed, then our democracy succeeds, our people succeeds, our country succeeds, and we're stronger and more unified as a result. When it comes into a conversation about trust, about accountability, about not making every issue so political, where does abortion fall in there? It's right dead center. It's a moral issue. It's a real issue of faith. Is it a life? Is a religious and an ethical issue? And, and we have to respect those who disagree with us. Abortion, you come to this position based on your teachings, based on who you are as a human being. If you're pro-life, you're not to be pilloried or disrespected because you believe that it is a life. If you're pro-choice, you believe a woman has the control and the rights to make her decision in the way that she thinks is best in consultation with her doctor, but it's her decision. And so there is no middle ground. There is no compromise that's easily achievable. And I just wish that we would lower the decibel level so that we can agree to disagree. Uh, There's an initiative now that's being conducted by the national governors that we learn how to disagree better. And abortion is the number one issue. Respect people with with a point of view different than yours. Appreciate the fact of how they come to that point of view. And just know that It's not easy to find that sweet spot, and maybe it doesn't exist, but at least we have to try. So then how do voters uh, think about this in November? Because I know you're saying this isn't a political issue. For women of a certain reproductive age, though, this is a top of mind issue. So how should they navigate this? But that's the whole point. And there are women of of reproductive years who are pro-life. They have a right to that point of view. Of course. They have, right to, they have a right to advocate, but I don't hear it in most of the coverage that the question becomes a woman's right to choose or not. Men's really not 
what the abortion discussion is about. I'm a message guy. I'm a language guy. I'm on your show because I focus on words. And the people who are pro-choice, and they've changed it. They talk about reproductive health. They've changed the lexicon. They've done so in a smart way. But either you're pro-choice or you're anti-choice. And for women who believe it's a life, it's not a choice. So the language doesn't fit them. And in the end, this is a really good conversation to have because we don't get a chance to have this dialogue. It's not a choice. And whether or not you agree with that, this is a point of view for about one third of America. And we respect the rights of those with 10% or 20%. Surely we should respect the point of view of the third, maybe up to 40% of the female population. I do want to emphasize that even as I'm explaining this, I want to put it in context. There are more women, particularly younger, who are pro-choice rather than pro-life. And as you get, the younger you get, the more likely you are to be pro-choice. That said, we have always argued in this country that we have to protect the rights of, of minority populations, minority in terms of numbers, not just physical. And I don't think we're doing such a good job right now. Then how do we do a good job? Because you said you're a message guy. How do we change the message? How do we change the language? I don't know. I don't. I, you know what? This is why I never have these conversations. And I've only waited in it over the last 24 hours because it's so important. And I'm trying to play the role of honest broker. I'm trying to put forward both sides. And there'll be comments. I look forward to reading them. Although it's on YouTube, the comments are all negative about everyone and everything. So be careful what you believe. But I'm trying to approach this and I don't have the answer because this is a moral issue. You and I could disagree completely and we're not gonna change each other's minds. So I'm asking people who are engaged in this debate to accept that you won't change someone's mind, but you can at least treat them with respect, assuming that respect comes back to you you can at least have a discussion with an open mind and a desire to understand, a desire to project empathy and compassion for those people who you disagree with. That's, it's not a good answer, but that's the answer I have right now. Are we anywhere near that more optimistic way that you're talking about? No. Do you see us getting there anytime soon? No. I do now want to pivot. This week, President Biden unveiled a new student loan relief plan that would impact more than 30 million Americans by either lowering or eradicating their debt. The Supreme Court, as we know, shot down his sweeping student loan forgiveness plan just last year. So do you think that this is a way for President Biden to appeal to younger voters who he was losing over his Israel policy? Uh, absolutely. It's a blatant attempt to buy votes. It's the most blatant attempt uh, really since uh, Trump wanting to sign the tax cut checks with his own name on it before that election. Every time I think politicians can't stoop any lower, they do. And they do on both sides. They do on all sides. And anytime they can get an advantage, they're going to take it. I just think it's awful. It is awful to ask people who could not afford to go to college, who went right to work, to have them have to pay through tax dollars the uh, opportunities of those who could afford or took loans. That's not what our country is based on. We all have to make an investment. We all have to have, to have some sort of commitment to our future, to the country's future. And the Supreme Court said what you're doing is wrong. And he's just trying to do it again. And yes, you're correct, it will help him, but it doesn't make a good policy. And once again, I have to say, I don't care whether or not it adds votes to his electoral total. It's wrong to make people blue collar workers, working class voters, first generation immigrants, people who did not have that opportunity to have to pay for this with their tax dollars. We're all in this together. There are some ways that we have to reduce the cost of education. 
that is a correct objective, but not by giving people a blank check. Do you think that in turn, this type of policy, him going on this platform is going to alienate blue collar workers who are Democrats? I know it. I can see it. I see it in the votes right now. Joe Biden is doing better among upper middle class suburban women than any Democrat in a long time. But he's losing working class men. He's losing. He may actually, this is, blows me away, but it's possible that Donald Trump will get a higher percentage of the non-government union vote than any Republican in modern times, and even more than that, that he could actually be Joe Biden among that voter block. And they are mad as hell in watching the president try to give a gift to those people at their own expense. Why do you think that is? Is this the icing on the cake? Is this the impetus? How could President Trump get those union voters? By doing exactly what he's doing right now. He's within a few points of them in the polling that we have. I don't know if there's any surveys that show him ahead, but his campaign is actually doing quite well. And Joe Biden's campaign is doing very badly. And I don't think that Biden ever expected there to be a backlash. After all, giving people free money is usually politically smart. In this case, it brings up an awful lot of resentment. And the fact that Biden is doing everything he can again and again to try to make, try to pay for someone else's education with your tax dollars, I don't think it's going to fly. You know, he ran on this, that he would help get rid of student loans. And last summer, we saw that the Supreme Court shot that down. Does this have a chance at passing the, this time around? Or is this just giving false hope eight months away from an election? I believe when Biden says he's committed to this, I believe I believe him. I trust him. When the Supreme Court says that it is improper, I trust them in the decision that they're making. I think he's going to do everything he can. I think it's gonna help him in the polls. I think it's gonna make a lot of people angry with him. But look, young people look at the oldest president in history. He's older, he's older than some of their grandparents. And they just, he's gotta do something to get them on board. Abortion is great. It's a very motivating issue among 18 and 29 year olds. And I think this will be an equally impactful motivational issue. As we know, and as we've discussed before, the economy is a top issue as we head into November. And March's CPI report found inflation was worse than anticipated for the fifth month in a row. What does this mean for President Biden? Well, I, you and I have had this conversation. I've done this before. It's really not inflation. It really is affordability. In the end, when people go to the store and they realize that they can't get that package of meat, they're not saying, oh my God, look at that inflation. They're saying, I can't afford that. Food and fuel matter most. Housing and healthcare also matter a tremendous degree. And in all four of those places, higher prices are affecting people's quality of life all across the country. And unlike unemployment, that affects those people without a job and their family members, inflation, affordability affects everyone. So I think that this is a big voting issue. And I think this is one of the reasons why Trump has been tied with or even ahead of Joe Biden in those key swing states. Yeah, a recent uh, uh, Wall Street Journal poll found Trump winning Arizona, Michigan, Georgia, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and tied with Biden in Wisconsin. So he's tied in one winning one of uh, six of those key battleground states. Frank, can you read the tea leaves for us? What does this mean seven months out? Well, since that poll has been done, there have been several others that show Biden catching up to or coming close to Donald Trump. We're going to spend over $2 billion on negative ads in those seven states, targeting 5% of the people in those states who might possibly change their minds. So if you're in one of those states, God help you. Every time you turn on the TV and it's gonna start shortly, all you're gonna get is negative ads about the two candidates and it's just gonna be awful. For everybody else, we're not even gonna see the campaign. The candidates aren't gonna show up. If you live in New York, 
The only way you're going to see a candidate is if they're in New York City to raise money. If you're in California, don't be surprised if you see Democrats in L.A. and San Francisco and no place else. They're there to raise money. For Republicans, to see them down in Texas and Dallas and Houston, again, just to raise money. I think it's going to be a nail biter. I'm already trying to speak to secretaries of state, and I hope that they hear this message here because how they count the votes are going to matter. If it takes them days for an election this close, it's going to jeopardize the public's confidence in the results. It's going to play into those who who advocate conspiracy about stolen votes. Uh, I think we're not gonna know on election day who's gonna win, and I don't think we're gonna know the day after either, and God help us. It's gonna be a nail biter. It is basically Groundhog Day of 2020. What do you think some messages that we learned last time that we can implement now? And I wanna know that for the media too. I mean, what do you think, have they learned anything from four years ago? No, no, they haven't. Why is why does it take so long in Pennsylvania to count your ballots? Florida gets it done in four or five hours. Why does Pennsylvania take days? Why does California, why are we still getting votes in on Saturday and Sunday in that state? Are you stupid? I know exactly what I'm saying. To the voters of Pennsylvania, you're not stupid. To the Secretary of State, get your act together. You have to count the absentee ballots ahead of time. You have to at least process it. And if you don't do it, then you're gonna be responsible. I don't know who the name of the person is. If I did, I'd say it right now. You're gonna be responsible for the shit show, you can bleep that out, that's gonna happen in America. I hold the Secretary of State of Pennsylvania personally responsible. Fix your laws, fix your counting, or be prepared to be responsible for the greatest political shit show in American history. You think I'm that this is go- <laughs> I know you No, and you think that this is going to be more climatic than 2020? It could be because we didn't expect what happened in 2020. We're all prepared for it in 2024. <laughs> in 2020 it just happened. In 2024, we're going to seek to make it happen if we think our side lost. And I'm from Pennsylvania originally, um, born and raised, lived there for over two decades. Do you think that this election is going to come down essentially to the Keystone State? Because you had some strong ver- words for the Secretary of State. Yes, because Wisconsin knows how to count their ballots. Michigan knows how to count their ballots. Florida knows how to count their ballots. Why does Pennsylvania, every election cycle, and they would say, Trump would accuse the uh, people of Philadelphia of dumping ballots. Where are they finding these uh, 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 boxes of ballots that are 97%, 98% Democrat? The answer is they're early votes or they're absentee votes from precincts that are overwhelmingly Democratic. Where the hell are they? You can register them. Why can't you do what Florida does and get your process in order so that the American people have an accurate, fair, reasonable accounting of what happened on Election Day? And the other problem is there are some states that allow people to postmark their vote on Election Day. So if they get it on Friday or Saturday after the election, it still counts. No. Election Day is Tuesday, the second Tuesday after the uh, after the what was it the first Tuesday after the second Monday. Count your votes. And election day is election day. By the way, we in this country give more people an easier time of voting. You can vote at the machine ahead of time in most states. You can vote absentee in most states. You can now vote by post. How much easier can we make it if your vote isn't there on election day? It's your fault. It's not the government's fault. It's your fault. You know when the election day is going to be? If you can't get your act together, I'm going to use a bad word there. If you can't get your act together, then maybe you just forfeit your right to be heard. 
We're about seven, eight months away from Election Day in November. What specifically are you looking out for right now? I'm watching the intensity within the black community. I, in my own polling, show young black males giving Donald Trump not just a second look, but a third look. And some of them are starting to say, this is where I want to be. I'm watching the Latino vote, the very first nationwide poll to show Trump now getting a plurality of Latinos and Hispanics. I'm watching, as we talked about before, the union vote, uh, because that is a Democratic core in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and they are certainly shifting. And I'm watching the suburban female vote, which is what gave Joe Biden his election, and they're not happy with Donald Trump. So I'm seeing these shifts within the electorate, and I'm wondering which ones will hold and which ones are temporary. And the answer to that question is the answer to who wins. Why do you think we're seeing this shift of minorities to Donald Trump? Is it more I like him better or it's I'm really unhappy with President Biden? That's that is the sixty four thousand dollar question. And it's more the latter than the former. They look at Joe Biden. They look at his age. They look at his shuffle. They watch him. They listen to him. And they're not convinced that four years from now, he will still be president. They're not convinced that he can do the job. We're not electing him for election day. We're electing him for the next four and a half years. And they're not happy with Trump either. But they wonder, can Joe Biden actually do the job for the next four and a half years? And that's something that Trump has not been affected at. Trump should stop saying, this is not an election for November of 2024. He should ask people, can you imagine Joe Biden still president five years from now? That would be a much better campaign. And that would be a really powerful campaign message against the incumbent president. Trump doesn't do it because he doesn't even respect Biden's holding that office. Well, Frank, another really interesting conversation here. I'm grateful for them per usual. Frank Luntz, thank you so much for joining me.